Okay, so let's get started. Um, so again, Peggy Project is uh, a project that's been looking at the preservation of electronic government information. And we've been around for, um, uh, we've been around uh, since about 2017 working together. And one of the things that we've noticed and, and one of the, the kind of the, give you a problem example um, and the example of the challenges that we face is um, just so, and this is a really simple one, one that, um, you know, there's no judgment behind this, but it's definitely something that we want to acknowledge. And so a, a quick example of the issues that we face when it comes to pres preserving electronic government information. Um, if you look at on this particular screen, it shows you two screen captures. One is from the catalog of government, um, government publications, and the other one is the website for the Marine Mammal Commission. And we run into an issue where we have in the catalog of US government publications, the official documents from the Marine Mammal Commission that are collected by the, the GPO um, go only date up to 2016. Um, so it's, you, we don't have within our catalog things that are more recent. Um, and this could be for a, a variety of reasons. One of them being that um, they are not, the, thing, the kinds of things that they are publishing are not necessarily seen as um, part of the depository system. Um, but there's a lot more on this website. If we go to the Marine Mammal Commission website, there's a, there's many, many, many reports here um, that would be helpful and useful for people. And what we're concerned about is just making sure that those things are getting captured somehow. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk today about what we've been doing in thinking through this problem, um, the ways we've been trying to talk about it, the ways we've been um, working with other uh, groups in this ecosystem within who are, have interests in this area um, and the projects we have planned for the future. And so with that, if anybody wants to jump in here on that one, I'm gonna hand it off to, I think, Sherry. Hi everyone. Uh, for those of you who I maybe haven't met yet, uh, my name is Sherry Laster uh, and I'm the head of OpenStack Collections at Arizona State University. I think we'll all just introduce ourselves as we kind of go along. Um, um, I've been working with the Piggy Project since um, basically since 2017 as well. Um, so one of the things that um, is important with any kind of project organization or any endeavor really is trying to make it clear what we're trying to do and how we wanna work with each other and then with others outside of the project. And a big part of our accomplishments in the last year, it looks small, but I think it's it's important to note is that we've been we've revised our vision and our mission statements for the project. So this is this is um, for those who may have been following along for us with us for the last few years. This is a little bit different, but we hope that um, this is something that resonates. So we see our vision as um, imagining a world where government information is preserved and accessible for an engaged public and equitable democracy, and our, our mission to achieve this vision, uh, we advocate on behalf of current and future users of public information in order to develop the community of practice that we think is going to be needed to, to more richly preserve and provide access to electronic and born digital government information. It will take many hands and lots of people cooperating and learning and contributing. So we, we want to work together to help libraries build capacity to preserve historically significant born digital government information. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our current uh, steering committee membership. And um, as you, we'll all introduce ourselves as we go along, uh, we've been fortunate to work with some other project partners, both um, some folks that, as, as former members of our steering committee, as well as um, other people that we've been able to collaborate with over the last several years. And there's a full list of, of our, of our um, current and past contributors on our website. Next slide. And I think that's me. Thanks, Sherry. Um, for those that may not know me, I'm Robbie Siddle. I'm the government information librarian at the University of North Texas, and I'm also incoming chair of Godor. Woohoo! And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got started and what we've done um, during 
our existence thus far. So we were sort of born out of a meeting that former Dean of Libraries, Martin Halbert, participated in at a Federal Depository Library Conference in which he sat on a panel with others to talk about the preservation of government information. And that conversation largely focused on print materials. And Martin has always been concerned with born digital content. And so he decided it was important for us to start having conversations and discussions. And he worked with CNI to host a summit in 2016 in conjunction with the CNI meeting in San Antonio and several GovDocs community members were there as well as a collection of technology folks and archivists and all kinds of really big brained humans. And from that, we decided we wanted to have more conversations and we held another meeting in December again, along with CNI. And that is when we started to form our steering committee and made the decision to seek grant funding. And so we were able to apply for and receive IMLS funding for a national leadership grant. And as part of that grant, we did a few activities. We hosted a lot of meetings at various conferences. We had a national forum. We published several reports, one of which we received the, um, the Godort Award for, which we were grateful to be recognized for that. We also, um, collectively, our organization supported a, an environmental scan, and that is also available at PeggyProject.org if you'd like to read that. It was kind of a, a way for us to look at the landscape of born digital government information. And we have had in the past additional support, not only from our home institutions, but also from the Center for Research Libraries. And I think that's most of what I wanted to say about that. If I missed anything, somebody else, please chime in. And next slide, I guess. We also decided we to form an advisory board to help guide our work going forward. We felt like we have our own thoughts and ideas and maybe we get too insular amongst ourselves. So we wanted to also hear from people outside of Peggy to see what they think we might should be doing or, or how they see their communities of practice and, and ways in which we may be able to support their, support their information needs. And so this is our fairly newly formed advisory board. We've had two meetings with our board, two formal meetings, and they have reviewed and helped us um, kind of decide how to guide our work going forward. And we do have ongoing monthly meetings with our board as they are able to attend. And those have also been incredibly helpful and um, useful in, in planning our activities. Next slide. Now it goes to Scott. Um, I'm Scott Matheson. Um, I've been um, part of Peggy, I guess, since the, this, the one of the, the second meeting, um, second uh, organizational meeting. Uh, and what we've, one of the things we've worked on over the past uh, year or two, it's sort of an outcome from the sort of fl flowed from our national forum, uh, was this idea of a, a backbone plan for the organization to help catalyze um, all of you to catalyze our community. And we see these three sort of pillars as a way to, to help bring people together but also to support the work that, that individual institutions or, or uh, consortia could do. And, and we see this as sort of education and, and a little bit of advocacy, sort of uh, helping people understand what the issues are. 
um, and, and why it's important to catalog and make it accessible and preserve uh, electronic government information that may not look like a traditional publication. Uh, and then a, another pillar is sort of thinking about organizational, uh, how, do, how do we leverage our existing organizations and our existing partners so that we can build on that to actually develop uh, programs that, that can capture these materials um, and then sort of the, the piece that flows from that is the technical infrastructure, which is the more technical issues uh, around actually pres harvesting, preserving, uh, categorizing, and, and keeping accessible materials, uh, you know, government information that may not look like a traditional PDF or, uh, you know, a, even a, a well-documented data set, but something that can actually uh, continue to be used um, by the public. Uh, we de we're definitely aware that, that there's a lot of um, preservation and that there are record schedules and that there are archives. Um, but we've, one of the things that we've noticed is that there's, there are things that, that go into NARA, out of agencies and into NARA, uh, or out of commissions and into a, an archive, but then are not available because of resource constraints. So the goal here with the plan is to help um, the, our community work together to understand and uh, work to overcome some of these challenges uh, to, to move us towards our vision um, of, of making sure that electronically produced or born digital information uh, remains available to the public. And I think I'm back on. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted as a group not just to talk about born digital preservation, but also to try to engage more in various activities. And so as part of our backbone plan, we came up with these three categories, these three buckets, and have developed some ideas for projects within them. And so in looking at the educational infrastructure, we, we knew we wanted to, to do something in which we could um, have kind of a, a proof of concept that other libraries may be able to utilize or build from or work with in their own institutions. And so I was greatly inspired by a former Godort chat with Andrew Dudash when he talked about his Docs in the News project. And at UNT, we currently digitize our state government information. The state depository ceased to exist, but we still receive materials. And so we digitize those. And I thought it might be interesting to kind of adapt Andrew's project and evolve our digitization project into searching for and collecting born digital state publications. And as part of that process, um, we can uh, develop some best practices and some guidance that may be utilized by other libraries. Um, around the country. And so we've just posted at UNT a student position to help with this project. We'll probably get started more in, in earnest in the fall. And we're going to just choose a couple of state agencies and start harvesting content from their site, seeing what's getting posted via Twitter or in the news. And so things that we know the public may be directly interested in. And then we kind of hope to compare that to what we get in our print boxes, just to see if there is duplication across um, what we're receiving from the state library and, and then what's being published also online. So we hope to be able to share out some, some guidance and best practices from that project within the next year. And thanks to Andrew for the inspiration. <laughs> Uh, am I next? This is James. 
You are. Okay, sure. good. Hi, all. This is James Jacobs. I'm the uh, US government information librarian at Stanford. And as I said, I've been, um, I've been working on Peggy uh, since the very beginning and even before, um, before Peggy was Peggy. Um, I'm gonna talk about the Anita Schiller Digital Government Information Library. This is a project that we started to work on with the Internet Archive um, to, um, the Internet Archive has a lot of government information within the archive, uh, both um, web harvested content, digitized content, um, uh, and other kinds of materials that have just been um, deposited into, into the archive. Um, that includes uh, state, local, international, uh, US, federal um, government information. Those collections are kind of scattered throughout the Internet Archive. And um, yes, I would I will mention that, uh, Bernadine. Thank you. Um, those collections are scattered throughout the, the Internet Archive. And as as you all know, it's kind of hard to find materials within the archive. Um, and so we've endeavored to work with the Internet Archive um, folks to um, to pull together um, uh, metadata and collections from across the archive um, into one uh, digital government information library uh, that will be easier to search, easier to find materials from all levels of government, um, and easier to um, to have other libraries use those materials, whether they want to they want to catalog them themselves. Um, or just uh, offer a, a, an access point into um, the Digital Government Information Library. Um, as, as Bernadine noted, um, we're calling it the Anita Schiller Digital Government Information Library. Anita was a, um, a, a longtime ALA, and uh, I believe she was a co-founder of Godort, um, and worked with, uh, with Bernadine, worked with many of us for, for many years. Um, she passed away earlier this year, and um, I felt um, uh, particularly um, connected to Anita. She was um, she was one of my mentors, and and I knew her for, for a very long time um, from from when I started to work at UCSD uh, back in two thousand three. Was that or two thousand two? Somewhere around there. Um, and so we um, we decided to to put her name on the project because she has been um, an inspiration to to many of us um, and was also the the grandmother of of free government information um, the website the the blog that that uh, that I and several others run and so we wanted to continue her um, her input and her impact. On, on government information. So that's why we named it after her. And I think uh, I'll pass it on to the next person before I start tearing up. Thanks, James. Uh, this is Shari again. So the, the third uh, project that uh, we just want to uh, share with you is significantly less specific at this point in time, but it is an area that's equally important to uh, what we see as a work that's needed to bring together uh, the resources that it takes to do the, the ki these kinds of projects and efforts. And so we're calling this sort of our advocacy and research program, uh, but there's kind of two uh, main components to it. So one of the, the, um, the uh, conclusions that we've really been able to draw from our work over the last several years is how important it is to bring uh, libraries on board with the need to collect and preserve foreign digital government information. It's, it's always going to be an effort and initiative that is going to take lots of, lots of institutions, lots of different approaches, and lots of um, people making contributions into this work. And in order to help persuade uh, uh, folks that, that this is necessary, this is important, and to help us better understand what the most pressing needs are, we do think that there are some opportunities to um, 
do some, do some research projects that will help answer some questions that we often get or that we ourselves ask about, about this problem space. So I don't wanna to talk too much about the exact research that we're, we're thinking about because what we're actually planning to do is first develop a research plan. So we're going to lay out what it is that we think are interesting questions, um, see what we can um, amongst ourselves or, or within our institutions work on. I'm sure that as part of this, we'll be putting some ideas out in the world. So for those of you who are interested in research and interested in, in um, the opportunity to, to kind of dig into some really important questions in a little bit more of a formal way, I, we would love to hear from you because I think we're gonna have a lot of interesting ideas and opportunities there. And then the other areas is advocacy. And so this includes advocacy with, within our profession, within government information, librarianship, um, with other folks who work in libraries and archives who maybe are not uh, working with government information or government documents in kind of a formal way, but may work in all kinds of other ways uh, that, that would benefit from being aware of what these issues are and maybe uh, would like to contribute in some way. Uh, we also see advocacy as uh, collectively finding ways to speak to other organizations and projects, including other advocacy groups, especially uh, government transparency groups. We have, turns out we have a lot in common with them, um, and, as well as speaking to our, our friends and colleagues who are uh, working, working at agencies, working on these issues on, on you know, our partner side, um, as well as uh, policy advocacy. So telling uh, Congress what we think. So um, all of these are, there's so many different components that go into to a strong advocacy program. And I think that that's something that we're very interested in exploring and finding ways that we can make an impact and um, get, the, get the, this problem and, and the opportunities put together with folks who, who may be able to uh, help um, amplify our voices and vice versa. So um, I think that's really what I wanted to say about the, the projects. Um, next slide, please. And before we get, I, I, we, we're really excited to hear your questions and talk some more about this. I do also want to acknowledge the amazing work of our other project team member, uh, Deborah Yoon Caldwell, who is steering our um, slides and putting links in the chat and uh, basically everything that you see that comes out of the Peggy project that, you know, it's beautiful, it makes sense, it's well organized, and it's got a lot of really good ideas in it. Deborah has had a significant and often entirely irreplaceable role in making that happen too. So thank you, Deborah. And with that, um, I think that did any, did any of my uh, Peggy project colleagues have anything you want to add in summation before we move to the question discussion phase? Okay, I don't hear anything. So I'm gonna hand it back to Linda as our moderator. Thank you all. Great. Um, so yeah, we're just gonna open it up to any questions that you have or um, comments and you're welcome to um, uh, uh, start your video and speak. speak now. I have a question. Sure, Jenny. Um, and maybe I'm just, oh, my camera's covered, oops. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm naive, but other state libraries and, or state archives aren't harvesting state born digital materials? I mean, Connecticut has been doing that for years. Yeah, Texas does it as well. Um, they have a what they call trail, where they use Archivit to harvest um, state websites, and they also we also have the Texas Digital Library, in which some legislative or or more legislative materials are going there, which is why we're concentrating more on state agencies and. Um, so the we it is valuable, but it's not always usable, if that makes sense. I mean, I, I think Archivit yeah. is important, but a lot of users don't know how to find what they're looking for within web archives. 
So I guess what we do, and I don't have anything to do with it. So please forgive me if I'm mistaken. So in Connecticut, we harvest web pages up to a certain level. We harvest the end of term governor's web page. Um, but we harvest the documents more than the web pages um, that are born digital for our state documents collection. Um, yeah, I, I, I understand that the funding are, is very different between it all. Um, I'm just always surprised when I hear that that other states don't have some of these things. Because for us, it's statutory, we have to. Yeah, can I respond to that? Um, that's, yeah. a, that's a great question, Jenny. Um, and as, as some folks in the, in the chat have noted that their states are doing things like that. Um, Cindy Etkin also mentioned that the Marine Mammal Commission um, is being web harvested by uh, the GPO. Um, however, as I pointed out in the chat, um, harvesting a website and making the publications on that website um, accessible and findable and searchable are, are two different things. Um, you can find uh, a catalog record for the Marine Mammal Commission um, within the CGP, but from 2016 to the present, um, how many of those publications that are only linked on the, on the MMC's website are actually cataloged um, and made, made accessible through the CGP? I, I don't think there's that many. And it's the same at the, at the state. Um, many states, I know California, Chris Kaznovich is on, our, is on the call today. We're harvesting uh, the California state uh, publications. Um, but we, we, need to have, we need to have more and better access. And that's one of the things that I think Peggy is, is trying to uh, remind and, and raise this issue um, of folks to, to do just that. Yeah, the archive, Archivit um, interface is also, it's assuming that you have a little bit of knowledge of what you're looking for. Um, so you kind of ha have to be searching for known. Yeah, um, the word that Chris uses as a phrase is digging it out. <laughs> you have to figure out how to dig it out and that's a problem. Yep. I just point, uh, Bernadine, this got embedded, embedded. y'all are, y'all love your chat. It's, <laughs> there's so many chats in here, I'm trying to keep up with some of them. Um, but Bernadine mentioned um, providing the information to the members of the JCP in here. Um, is there anything else? Yes, and I, I just, just speaking in, in kind of general terms about, um, about uh, how we can, make sure that we're getting our message through to particularly members of Congress and, and staffers as well. Um, we, um, we have a, a, a great partner in um, our um, advisory board member, Daniel Schumann, who is um, the, uh, I forget the exact title, but the advocacy lead for, for Demand Progress Education Fund. And um, we're eager to work with him to hook up with, with his work and other organizations so that when we're sending these messages forward it it can come from us and it can come from others too so so i think that's a big part of some of, of an area that we we want to to uh improve what we're doing um in the coming months uh quick question michael here um Somebody mentioned that intergovernmental agencies are often um, left out of scope because many jurisdictions only collect materials. It's for Sherry, actually. They only collect materials that are strictly within their scope. Um, is, and forgive me if I missed this while during the discussion, how are we, uh, is that being discussed at any of the meetings Peggy is having with agencies? Uh, I mean, how do we fix that problem? Yeah, so so really, I, I think, and I'll give my opinion on this and hope to hear from my colleagues as well, 
well. I see this as, as where um, libraries, um, uh, whether at research universities or um, whether they're public libraries or other kinds of libraries, we are the essential part of solving that because we don't have our, for, for a academic research library, like where I work at Arizona State University, our collection, uh, our collections philosophy um, uh, gravitates around what we need to develop our collections for our researchers. And so we're not bound by saying, well, we can only collect things that are along certain jurisdictional lines. So are the best things that we can do and are, and I see my, my, <laughs> my friend from the, this, um, Arizona, from the State Library of Arizona is, is on the call, Susan Leach Murray, uh, is, is that um, we, wanted, we want to have our conversations so that when we are building our collections, we're focusing on things that are further out of scope for the state library, but we are able to collect because all of it would be within scope for us, but we don't have the resources ourselves to collect everything either. And so I think that it's it's kind of an example of why it's so important to engage libraries and to, to um, really work on ways to send message to library administrators and other and faculty stakeholders on the importance of this work because really, in, in a lot of cases, there are these things that, that the library is in the best position to start to fill that gap. So that's how I see that, that issue. And what would be an example of an intergovernmental agency that gets left out in the cold uh, is just... just... It, and I'm not, I'm not saying, I haven't run this list by Susan, so, <laughs> so don't, <laughs> don't quote me on this specific example, but for example, there are, um, there are um, organizations that are multi-county. There are um, different kinds of, of districts that are not, it's not the, it's not the county, it's not the city, it's something else, you know, so, so different and different parts of the country, as I've learned from moving from state to state over the years, and you learn, wait, there's this whole other kind of government district. And, and so, um, I, so those might be examples. There's also, um, I know some, some public private partnerships that would be, I, I call it quasi governmental. I don't know if that's actually the thing you call it, but that's what I call it. it that would, that would definitely be out of scope for, for certain collectors, but may not be out of scope for us. Um, okay. Chris, Chris Kasanovich makes, makes a great point, regional government. So, so um, the example is the Association of Bay Area Governments. Yeah. So, so these, and for some states, maybe some states, this is within scope for their state libraries and others it may not be, or uh, they, they may have different approaches. So I think that um, the other, the other thing I guess I'll say about this and I will stop talking, uh, but the other thing is that I think that there, there is a really important uh, civic engagement role that comes with this kind of work. And I know that's something that's been really well developed and modeled by the Civic Switchboard, civic switchboard Project, uh, which is, which really to me, like helps to answer that question of how can libraries work on these kinds of projects and not work in isolation, so. That's my take on your question, Michael. Good question. Uh, and thanks for all the detail. And thanks for the uh, help and the comments from Chris and others. And I just want to, this is changing things a little bit, but because there's several examples being put into the chat, which are really good special districts and water treatment districts. Um, Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. Wow, some things I've never heard of even. Um, Robbie, I was gonna tell you that Andrew Dudash came into the session after you mentioned the project. I saw your message in the chat. Yeah, so kudos to Andrew, you, you inspired our state docs project. So thank you. I also just want to say John Oliver is probably one of the best human beings to highlight government information in popular culture. It's he he always and he often uses GPO authenticated documents for his um, images. And he got the Danbury Water Sewage Plant named after him and funds raised. So go Danbury, Connecticut. <laughs> and if that isn't an uh, a, a, an amazing honor. <laughs> I 
Wahnsinn. Any other questions? Yes, I would open up to the Peggy group. Is there things that you would like us to touch on? Um, no worries. I guess I would ask a, just kind of a, a general question and I don't necessarily feel like we need to run out the whole hour either. That's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm just curious um, if folks maybe wanna just put in the chat or um, if they wanna offer a moment or two um, when you speak with, with your colleagues within your own organization, institution, library, you know, whatever, wherever you may work, uh, do you, when you, do you think that this is the kind of thing that they would be surprised to learn about? Or when you say something like, oh, did you know that not all born digital government information is automatically preserved or or it's or not everything that's preserved is immediately accessible. Do you think that this is an idea that's kind of surprising to people, or do you think this is something that fits in more with kind of how library folks and, and others may think about information? Hmm. Yeah, depending on who you talk to, that's a good point, Susan. <laughs> Barry, I can just mention here in, in uh, Canada, when I, uh, when I try and talk to, you know, upper administration about my efforts with born digital information um, and stuff, they say, well, it's up to the government to be preserving that information. You know, we have, we have another mandate, but um, I really like the point you made about, you know, we're a research library. Right. And instead of, you know, collecting, you know, er, you know, all the important monographs and literature and that type of thing, I think it's really important to be collecting these kind of local ephemeral documents that are special to the region. So um, I've been trying to advocate for that, but um, often they think other places should be responsible. <laughs> yeah, that's um, Jenny mentioned something similar is how state agencies are often surprised about how the public might use their documents um, or the fact that the patrons might want old ephemera, <laughs> um, which, I mean, we, we, we went to, some of you know this, but some of you don't, definitely don't. Um, we went to the American Historical Association and had a really nice conversation with the historians about um, historical record for the things that they were studying. And one of the things that I found fascinating was they talked about the, you know, 95 to 2005 period and how that might kind of be a historical black hole when it comes to some of the documentation, especially on um, one person was studying war uh, and civil military relations and um, that there, you know, the lack of documentation of some of the decisions that were made and um, potentially, uh, so it, the, yeah, it's an interesting um, phenomenon. We have this proliferation of information, but yet, uh, things that might be in just in a PowerPoint in a meeting that suddenly we don't have the long historical record for anymore. Um, yeah, and that's great. Um, Susan Leach-Murray, those of you who aren't familiar, um, Susan, if you could put information about your group in the chat again, that would be helpful, I think. Um, uh, so that people can know it, because there is a, 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 a state lo and local group um, that gets together and talks every so often. And we'd have some new names I don't recognize on here um, that might be interested in that too. Sure, Susan, uh, yeah, I'll send out a recording um, after the holiday, because <laughs> I'm gonna take one. <laughs> And we don't usually, uh, um, we'll try to, I'll definitely uh, capture the chat. Um, the recording won't have the chat in it, but we can make that available through our listserv um, just because I don't have time to de-identify or anything. But uh, if you want to open up your, your camera, if you are have any comments, um, we have a few minutes left. And again, as Sherry said, we don't have to go to the end, but 
I'll invite you to, to comment or ask questions. Uh, Michael here. Does any, how does everybody feel with four months into the Biden administration about their approach to government information writ large? Um, so many different aspects of it. Um, I'm just curious what veterans of this profession think of, of his approach or his administration's approach. Good, bad, in the middle. I I'm working, so I can't make any political comment. As a state employee, I can't answer that. I apologize, but as a because I'm on state time, I can't answer your question. And I don't want to get anybody in trouble. By the way, it was yeah. just an honest question. I'm not here to start a fire. I think no, Sherry no. had. A, I think Sherry had a response. So if you want to, or someone did. Oh, I, I, I was, uh, I'm sorry, and I didn't see you unmuting, Jenny, I'm, I apologize. Uh, I was just going to say, Michael, from my perspective, it's much too early to tell. Mm -hmm. The only comment I will make, because I'm not making an opinion, I'm stating a fact, is there is a report out from, oh, I forget who it was. It's one of the scientific agencies stating that they are going to be updating their documents because they were, data was altered under the previous administration and under the current administration, they have permission to update. And I can't remember if it was, I get so many emails from different scientific agencies. I'm not sure which one it was. It was the EPA. Um, EPA, I believe. Yeah. Okay. So that's the only, that's, I'm stating a, just a comment, a fact, <laughs> no opinion. But I think you can infer yeah. from that. Yeah, that was, I think, in the news yesterday I saw. Yeah, and, and John just linked to the, um, to the Yeah, I guess I, I saw something in the email on the news announcements from one of the EPA agencies uh, several days ago. And I was surprised I hadn't seen it in the news until just recently. Yeah. So yeah. For folks who don't know, there's a group called EDGI, the Environmental Data and Governance Initiative. And they've been doing a really amazing work um, for the last four years. Um, analyzing, um, especially environmental agencies like EPA, um, but um, agency websites across the government to, uh, to see what information has been deleted or changed or, um, or you know, manipulated in some way. Um, they just recently uh, released a report um, so if you go to their website, you can you can check that stuff out. They do really great work. Maybe I can ask something. Um, it's it's not a it's just a general question. Um, I'm just wondering how how you you all are keeping kind of momentum going in the efforts, like with all with all the work that you're doing, um, kind of how do you keep the center center stage? I know some of, you know, I know some of it's your main focal work, but how do you keep it kind of present at all times, this issue? I'll try, I'll try first, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I think we don't always, <laughs> um, full disclosure, uh, but because we have, we're, you know, we're, I'm so lucky to be part of this, this incredibly creative, passionate, smart group that there's always stuff that we're interested in talking about and working on. And really it's the, the a lot of our work is, is spent on focusing our ideas and then our time so that what we're doing is actually uh, like makes sense and, and fits in with what we're trying to do. I know. Kind of looking at, at uh, others on this too. How do we, how do we keep organized? Deborah keeps us organized. <laughs> yeah, Deborah. 
I think we also have different focal focal points that so all of us come at it from a different perspective. I think some more uh, go government documents as a whole focus, Scott's law, so you know more that brings that knowledge, my background's data. So I think that helps in terms of the um, kind of staying within our, our orbits that we have. Robbie has yeah, that knowledge, I, I think, on state. <laughs> and and I think Sherry also kind of hit the nail on the head. It's like it's a it's a big collaboration. Like you're lucky to have kind of a really great pool of people, um, which I'm always envious of you guys here in Canada, right? We're so spread out and there's kind of few of us. So um it's interesting, maybe once you've uh, focused on the US and you get all this packaged and perfect, James, then maybe you can look at more of an international focus and look to your friends uh, up north. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that'll be the next month or so, I'm sure I'll get it all packaged up. Um, but Susan, you will, you will be happy to know that um, part of the Anita Schiller uh, Digital Government Information Library is uh, Canadian publications. Um, from the CGI PLN especially, um, but the, the hope is to start by collecting and aggregating and organizing the, the publications within the Internet Archive uh, and then branching out to, to other archives um, to sort of like the, the Digital Public Library of America does in aggregating its metadata. In, so it has a central metadata store, but not necessarily a central archive. I, I see your hand, Jenny, hold on a second. Um, so we wanna, we wanna do the internet archive, but then we wanna branch out to other archives and, and pull their metadata in as well. Sorry, Jenny, you were gonna say something. You're muted. Still muted. I'm sorry, my my laptop is acting up. Um, so my question, James, was for the Internet Archive. Mm -hmm. I'm not speaking for my state library because I'm not in a position. I'm not allowed to. But we have some stuff in Hathi, Hathi Trust, but most everything's in Internet Archive. Do we need to become a partner? Or does it automatically get pulled into the digital library, our state documents? Um, we, we haven't yet talked about um, expanding to, to have some sort of a partnership model, but at the moment, anything that's in the Internet Archive, any collection, um, whether it's state, local, um, uh, international or federal, uh, will get pulled into the into the library so nothing you need to do i mean we even have yeah, okay. podcasts from localities and things like that because i don't know that we would have the staff or the time to be able to i mean we don't even have the staff to have saturday hours we <laughs> lost those during covid i mean we're yeah. just we're only going to be open 10 to 4 um which is terrible but um My question was because we don't include anything that we didn't digitize. So a lot of other libraries when, you know, you used to have the exchange between states of state documents and a lot of libraries wanted to get rid of there. So they digitized a lot of our state, Connecticut state documents, but because we can't verify them, we don't link to them from our catalog. And so you know, I'm always telling people Internet Archive has it, and it would be really nice to have this to point people to. Yeah, we're hoping that we're hoping to be able to have facets, you know, so you can do a search for, I don't know, water and then facet down to Connecticut State or some county or, you know, so whatever the governmental jurisdiction is um, so you can you can get that material. Well, thank you, everybody. We are coming about to the end of the hour. And, um, see if there's any, I think James had one question. Was that for Cindy? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, that was for Cindy because okay. Cindy posted that the oversight.gov has 19,000 reports. 
Okay. Awesome. Um, <laughs> great. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Uh, again, we'll have a, a chat Thanks next Friday. Me. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, um, Peggy. And oh well, <laughs> it's kind of weird because I'm part of Peggy. But hey, yeah, yeah, Peggy. Um, so uh, um, definitely come back next week. We'll have a, just an open time to chat and say um, talk about what's coming up in ALA and. Um, if you are doing, art, as I mentioned, if you are doing any kind of RDIF, is it RDIF? Am I getting that right? For those of you who actually know this stuff. <clears throat> the government documents tracking, tagging RFID, thank you, RFID. <laughs> in your libraries. <clears throat> Please um, come because Andy is going to be here and she was really curious about, I think she actually is here today too. She's very curious about anybody who's working in that area. So if you are working on that, we can um, just ch chat a little bit about that too. Um, but uh, otherwise, I hope you all have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Um, hopefully get some sun where you are, maybe. Um, and I will see you all next Friday. Thank you, Peggy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Linda. Bye, everyone. <coughs>